Yes, welcome to Scremerston in Berwick. It's the home of Berwick Rugby Club and edition 10 of Borders Rugby in Focus is uh, coming from England for the first time today. And I'm delighted to say that uh, joining us is head coach of Berwick, Colin Young, the forwards coach, Paul Pringle, and of course, as usual, Dale Clancy is with us as well. And um, we'll start with you, Colin, actually, because... Um, Last weekend, you very, very nearly took the scalp of Las Wade, who are, at the moment, unbeaten. Yeah, um, we put a lot of focus on the, the start of the game uh, against Las Wade. Uh, we asked the boys to come out with a block, and they'd done that very, very well, um, to the point where we, we were 12 nil up at one time. Um, they had a couple of players in the bin. We didn't really capitalise on, on them uh, 10 minutes in the bin. Uh, and 12 nil up at half time, turning round, playing into the wind second half. Um, they scored straight away virtually for the kickoff, and they, it, it just made the game tight for the for the remainder 35 minutes basically, uh, to the point where we we lost it with the last kick of the game uh, uh, when they scored underneath the posts. And more or less the same thing happened at Murrayfield Wanderers, wasn't it? Because uh, um, they again were, were obviously going through a good patch and uh, you'd scored two tries. They hadn't scored any tries at all, but uh, they had a guy who scored four penalties and it was a, a very late penalty that nicked that one as well. So two very infuriating defeats. Absolutely. When you, you've you probably been the best team um, out of the two games, in both games, uh, to lose them narrowly at the end with a, with a penalty one one week against Murrayfield, and the conversion last weekend, it's fr it's frustrating. But the pleasing thing was the performance was there last week, where the performance at Murrayfield we it wasn't there. Um, so we are building, uh, probably a little bit slower than what a lot of the boys want to be, but there's still plenty of time left. There's whatever seven, 16 games left or whatever there's left in the league. So there's enough time uh, to, to do what we need to do. And Dale and I were talking about this last week, in fact, when we were talking about Berwick, and uh, we just felt that we can see there's the light at the end of the tunnel here. You're beginning to gel, because it's it's been difficult for everybody, obviously, getting into the into the season. But uh, you're, you're finding your feet now, and, and that's obviously apparent. Yes, yeah. I think every club was the same. It, it, whoever hit the ground running the first week, really... Uh, if you got a, a, a win, it just builds that momentum. If you got a, lo a, a or sorry, if you lost your first game, it just puts you on the back foot a little bit. And we probably started a little bit on the back foot with a with a call off uh, for Strathmore. We just you know, and it was like ten days without rugby, and then that ten days became another. So it was like seventeen days before a pre-season game. Uh, sorry, from our last pre-season game. So it was just a little bit on the back foot. Um, but I do believe we, we, we're turning the corner now. Um, getting some of the boys back from farming as well and, 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 and strength and depth uh, to the point where we've, we've got a good, strong second team out now. Well, Paul, there's some pretty good uh, forwards um, in the Berwick lineup at the moment and obviously you're working with them. How are you finding it uh, from the, the 18 months off now finally getting some rugby on the pitch? Yeah, I think Colin hit the nail on the head. I'd, because of where we were just before, the, before everything locked down, I mean, the guys were, we were flying at that point. You know, everything was coming off. We were executing everything fairly cleanly. Um, and I think the biggest problem for me is when we got back, I think the guys expected to be at that level again. And they were kind of forcing things and just being becoming frustrated very quickly. Um, that's kind of settled now. We've got past that point. We're setting kind of benchmarks every week and trying to move forward. Um, we're very fortunate in terms of numbers. So I was just saying to Dale earlier, we had last Thursday night, we had effectively three packs to work with on the Thursday night so you can do live scrummaging you can do live lineouts, and I think for me we've really seen the benefits of that just on Saturday past um, so yeah it's great they're a good bunch of lads and um, they're all very keen we're getting a few experienced older heads back as well which always helps I think in this league you need to be a little bit streetwise and a little bit switched on so that's helping us and yeah we're just looking forward to Saturday again to be honest just to taking another step forward now, you mentioned some experienced people coming back, but that doesn't include you at the moment, does it? <laughs> no, I, I think at uh, 42 now, I think that might be, that ship sailed. That's early, isn't it, for a prop deal, I think? I've <laughs> <laughs> got another decade, I don't know, I think. Yeah, I might, it might look like a prop, but definitely. <laughs> I hid in the back row for many years pretending to push, so I think that's probably how I got out to, to 40 before having to pack in again. Right, so you're in fifth place at the moment. Um, you've played four games, so one less than the, the four clubs in front of you, and you're on 11 points. Um, as I said to, to Colin, you've had two narrow defeats, but 
presumably you'll be sort of pretty pleased with the way you are at the moment. Yeah, I, I think I would say in terms of points, but probably not pleased because we would expect to be, you know, we could arguably be six points better off. Um, but at the same time, I think the performances are there. As I say, we're improving every week. Um, and yeah, I, I, I could quite honestly see us putting a run together now off the back of Saturday. Um, and it'll start with what will be a tough game against Tower Fife uh, at home this weekend. Well, Dale, I think back in your days, long, long ago <laughs> in the past, you, you did actually play Berwick in, in a board league match, is that right? Yeah, I think the three games that I played in um, in senior rugby, no. <laughs> actually, when I first started senior rugby, Berwick were in the same league as, as uh, people, so um, obviously I played with all the time. And they were always very competitive games. And I remember there was the well, the one occasion that sticks down here is when we came down, we actually won in the league because we got promoted that year. And that was where uh, Neil Cruikshank, who used to play back row for us, got announced as man of the match is Neil Cranshaw so it's been a nickname that's stuck for, <laughs> for years I don't think it was a language barrier but yeah Berwick used to you know we played them a lot in the border league over the last few years as well when I was playing and it's it's when we started at the same we were just speaking off air Peebles and Berwick were almost at the same kind of level and I was wondering where players went because Peebles have a, an issue with players perhaps going to university um, maybe even trying to further themselves going to other teams and you know Colin just saying there that a lot of their players have, have left as well you know, to try and try and do, do similar things. Really, they've lost a lot of players, and, and even in my time, Moody Tate um, Riddle was the the name that I was trying to remember. That Colin reminded me they've they've had a lot of players. Max Lermonth as well. So there's been an abundance of good talent that came out from Berwick. Of course, we've spoken to Langham before, and and they find it tough, obviously geographically, and uh, certainly Berwick have uh, the same issues here. It's uh, right stuck up on the coast. It's a long way from all the other border teams. Um, but we all look on in, in a lot of admiration, I think. I, I totally agree. Like it's it's um I've, we were speaking in the car as well. I've always somehow avoided coming down and doing the coverage for the sevens. Um it's been one of those weekends where you get it was a double header and you done the Saturday, but the it's it's almost a bit of a journey for some of the border teams, but Berwick have to do it twice as much as what anybody else, like well, more than twice, but you know that they're a club which is, is given a lot to Scottish rugby, even though they're located in England, you know, they've given a lot of um you know they've they've had success themselves at, at, at Murrayfield, but the players that they've produced, they've had you know Scotland internationals, they've had Scotland sevens internationals, they've had players that have maybe went on to other teams to 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 win titles and sevens titles. So they've they've provided a lot to to Scottish rugby, and I think it's similar to it's similar with the the, the argument that you have with Orkney. They they have to travel as well. Berwick have to travel a lot to fulfil their their fixtures in a season, and it's something that you know. Has, has a huge impact on, on Scottish national rugby because they've, they've certainly played their part. And we'll certainly be exploring that a little bit later on with our guests Colin and Paul. But let's look back to last weekend, Dale, and in contrast to seven days before when all but one of our teams won from the Premier National Leagues, this week nine defeats, including the East League as well, all the way from home, and two wins both at home for Gala and Hoyk. And let's start with Hoyk. 14-10 winners against Glasgow Hawks, who were sitting second in the table at the time. Um, it seems like a close win. They were actually dominating the territory and and obviously the, the possession as well and uh, you were commentating o on the game as well it seemed like 14-10 was um, not quite the result that probably Hoyt were looking for although they would be delighted with the home win Yeah, I think it was almost a game that they could have thrown away I think um, Glasgow Hawks were starting to build into the game I think the, the, the perhaps the the youth of the Hoyt team, we were speaking about this about Berwick, but the youth of the Hoyt team were perhaps a little bit inexperienced and maybe not knowing how to control and manage the game. And Glasgow Hawks started to, to grow in it, starting to get their big runners in a little bit more in the second half, breaking a few more tackles and getting in behind the line. But Hoyt's defence overall was pretty strong and I think they made hard work of it. Um, we did speak about their squad the week before, but I think they've, like Matty Carrier led from the front, good try at the end. But a little bit of these errors come in though, and Matty will kill me for saying it, but you know, missing a couple of line outs when they're five metres out. They hit those line outs, you've seen how easy they got over the line. They're those things that can put games to bed. But they'll be chuffed, that's three wins from three at home. Um, start. They need to start winning on the road if they're going to start pushing up the table. But you know, beating a team like Glasgow Hawks, who've been going so well, it's a, it's, a good it's a good result for them and something that they can perhaps start building on. But I think these little things need to start being maybe ironed out by Hoyke. They need to have a little bit more accuracy with 
with the, when the when the chances present themselves. Some tackle by Corey Tate at the end, wasn't it? Oh, no, I know. I was. <laughs> uh, I, I, he was came out of nowhere. Um, I just you almost just seen the uh, Pinkerton. I think the outside centre for Glasgow Hawks. He just kind of fell to the ground, and I realised there was a hike number sixteen there. But it was a brilliant tackle, especially right at the end. Four points in a game. It's it's one of those tackles that you you need to make Hawks deep inside their own twenty two. And Pinkerton had a little bit of space from the missed penalty, and just when he starts running out. Corey Tate just did not slow down, didn't miss a step, ducked down and just kneecapped him and straight in a touch. So it was a great, great tackle to finish the game and, you know, and kill the kill the chances any comeback for Hawks. You were talking about nicknames earlier. I think Torpedo works for Corey Tate, doesn't it? Yeah, I think well, I, we'll have to see. Hopefully he can keep that up and, you know, keep that, that level of commitment and, and accuracy in the tackle up. But it was, a, you know, it was a good thing to watch back and see it on, on the, you know, social media and, various people sharing it was a good thing to watch Selkirk and uh, Jed both losing um, away from home GHA 34-10 there and Mar 28-19 we've mentioned before Mar have had uh, great battles with Jed in the past and uh, uh, but Jed I was talking to Lewis Young afterwards and he was he was fairly satisfied with the performance there and but Selkirk on the other hand still a bit of work to do yeah I think uh, Selkirk are still feeling the effects of, of players being out um, key players and key positions and I think they're having to really rotate their squad week by week to try and integrate these players back in because sometimes when they come back from injury, they're not up to, to sharpness. So I think it might take a little bit of time before we see a true reflection of what Selkirk are like. But that's a league season. That's just the way it goes. Sometimes your luck's in, sometimes your luck's out. With Jed reading the reports, it was they certainly put up a battle. Um, I think Mar certainly knew they were in with a game and it's a bit of a turn in fortunes for what we've been used to the last few weeks from Jed. You know, getting that win against Grammar is a really, really good win. But you know, that's that's a good performance to put in against Mark, as Mark are a, a very, very good side, um, one of the most consistent sides in Scottish rugby over the last five years, anyway. So to go up there and get a close result, they'll they'll be able to build some positives from it. It's still a defeat. They don't get any points with the margin of uh, defeat as well, but they'll certainly be be pretty chuffed with um, with the performance that they put in. And Mark top of the table. Yeah, that's. It's Mar have been the the kind of the all the, the kind of nearly runs for um, the last few years. They've they've been building and building and building, and I think Super Six perhaps came round at the right time for them. Um, it allowed them to really put a marker down in club rugby. I think with, without all the big boys away, they're almost the the team with the target on their back now. I think they're one of the they're one of the big teams in Scottish rugby now. Now, International won, and uh, there were two huge games, of course, Melrose and Bigger going head-to-head at Hartree Mill, both putting their undefeated um, tags on the line. In the end, it was uh, Bigger. We got a 20 points to five win, and from all reports, we had uh, Robin Purdy covering it for us uh, down there, but it was, it, was one, it was one for your mate Craig Borthwick, we think. Uh, the forward certainly dominated Melrose. Yeah, I, I know Borth does a bit of coaching down there as well, and to keep a Melrose team, which has been been pretty high in terms of scoring points over the last few weeks to keep them at just five points is really really impressive and I think if there's one thing I know Borth prides himself on it's it's his defence and you know even the, the, Davey Reeve the scrum half he's, I think he's about 113 now but he's uh, you know they rolled him out and he was playing scrum half and it's it's that sort of experience that you need from players to, to help control these big big games a lot of good players Andy Jardine playing for, for uh, bigger against his old team of Melrose you know they've got a lot of really good talent in that squad and you know, I think bigger. Again, we've said it before. They've got a chip on their shoulder from from not getting promotion, and I don't think there's a bigger scalp to get than another team that's undefeated, especially when it's Melrose. Now, Kelso, we were very light-hearted last week with uh, Bruce McNeil, Neil Hinnigan, uh in the programme, of course, and uh, they all agreed that they had to keep Klimo pretty quiet. And, and they did, in fact, as it turned out, because he went off quite early. But so did Andy Tate with a red card, 35-25 to air. Hard place to go to Millbrae, but as I say, Kelso were, were going great guns until that moment. They have to play air with 14 men for an hour. Yeah, that, we did say, uh, Bruce and Neil, last week, as long, you know, if they can keep it tight they were starting to build they started to look a little bit more controlled and mature in their play Kelso are looking like a really good squad so you know a 10 point defeat at Milbury is not a bad thing but you know these dirty Berwick lads getting sent off doesn't he help no so <laughs> they, yeah it'll be, it'll, he's a, a big part of the, the way they play he's he's 32 years old or 31 year old and he's he's got a lot of experience for Kelso he's been there for a long long time knows the club inside out, knows how they play, knows how they to control games. So to lose a player like Andy Tate's a, a big, big loss and it certainly would have had an impact on the game. 
one other game in National 1. It was a home win for Gala, who are sneaking up there at the number two position at the moment in the table. 32-0 against Boromir and some good tries. Yeah, um, they've been beaten quite convincingly there by Gala. Obviously not threatening because they've got no points. So it'll, Gala will be chuffed to get the win. I think they'll probably be a little bit... Um, they'll be a bit frustrated they couldn't get a bigger scoreline but I think they've got a good few weeks coming up they've got some some really good games to try and perhaps get a bit of a head of steam in that league and as, as we've said and, and Colin just said it when he started speaking earlier on uh, this evening he was saying that a win builds confidence and it's exactly what if you can get this run of games in a league campaign two, three good teams um, and get wins on the road and at home, it can build a lot of confidence. Now into Division 2 and Peebles took the, the scalp last week of Newton Stewart who were undefeated. They went to another team undefeated as well, GHK at the, the very top of the table. Peter Wright involved there with a few uh, ringers in, in the team as well and some some good good boys at GHK as well. They're doing very, very well and they, they ended up winning 28 points to 10. In fact, Peter did actually send a message via Stuart McFarlane to say thank you very much for the Peebles coverage the last two weeks. Gave us plenty of ammunition to work out a game plan and it worked yeah aye. It's, <laughs> that's um, the downside isn't it yeah it's a bit of, it's, that's Peter he likes other people doing his work no yeah, they, uh, <laughs> it was a very tough place for them to go I think we knew that last week um, off, obviously off the win for against Newton Stewart it was it was something that people then had to back up now speaking to a few of the guys at the club it was a it was a close game um, for a period of time it was quite a hostile place I believe and um, but I think the game perhaps there was a, a pivotal point in the game where a little bit of ill discipline meant that I think the crowd got on the back of the people's guys. I think the team GHK certainly got um, revved up by that and, and it led to people just slipping away a little bit. And we did say you, you have to compete away from home in a league campaign. The scoreline looks like they've, they've not really competed too much, but they've got a difficult game this week and coming up again. Dumfries Saints going pretty high as well. So another undefeated team. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a tough league. It's a it's a tough competitive league, and you know, there's especially at this time of the season, there's going to be some undefeated teams. Um, but it seems like people have got that kind of barren, bad bad kind of group of group of fixtures. Fortunately for them. They'll welcome GHK later on in the, in the, in the season, but you know it's, it's a difficult run of fixtures for them. Well, we mentioned Berwick earlier, obviously just narrowly losing at uh, last Wade, but into East League One and Haddington 33, Duns 17, a, a much better performance from, from Duns this week. Yeah, um, again, we've, we've said that Duns have, have, have been a little bit up and down in terms of trying to find like a real continuity and a structure to their, to their, uh, to their season. But it's just another, you know, it's like a, a difficult place to go to Haddington. Um, a lot of they're notoriously quite a big team, you know, big pack, and it's they, they like to plod about that park. So it'll be a difficult place for them to go, but an improved performance, and, and they'll be trying to want to build on that for the rest of the season. Now, no East League two games last week. We, we were trying to find out why. I spoke to Kenneth Poole at uh, Langham, and he doesn't know why either. It seems strange early in the season when you want to get boys out in the park. There weren't any East League two fixtures at all last week, so we're still trying to work that out. If anyone knows, do let us know. Uh, but in East League three, probably um, Galloway M would have preferred no match at all. Delkeith seventy five, uh, Galloway M nil. Ambulances on the pitch as well. I understand it was not a good day for Gala. Oh, they've um, they have struggled with. Well, they've, they've, they've had a lot of injuries over the last few weeks, like when we were at Galloway a few weeks ago. But Dal Keith are a, a good team. Um, I think connections in the in the borders as well. I know Jason Hendry's there as a as an assistant coach at Dal Keith, so they've got some border connections in there. But they were another team that were that were flying high, and and COVID kind of stopped them in the ranks. But they've 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 got, you know, they seem to be a team on the up as well. So to go, to go there and it's difficult to take for a team when you get an absolute hide in, but. You know, it's done now. It was away from home. They don't have to go there again. They can then concentrate. You know, Galloway can concentrate and realign their focus on, on this weekend coming. And certainly looking at the early results, Del Keith are red-hot favourites. Always have been, weren't they, on, on yeah. paper to win East League 3. And Earlston uh, losing out at Embry University at Peffer Mill. 29 points to 17 was the other game. Yeah, I think it's a, a, a tight game. Um, Edinburgh Uni, again, you, you never really know what kind of squad they're going to be chucking together, but... Erlston going away up to Edinburgh um, off the back of a win the week before so going up there again competing unfortunately for them on this occasion they, they, they come off second best but they, they'll, be, they'll be chuffed for two weeks they've, they've been able to string together two, two reasonably good performances and I think on the average of it they'll be pretty satisfied with their, uh, the last fortnight's business 
Okay, so that uh, wraps up the, uh, the the last weekend. As I say, not a not a great uh, weekend for Borders Clubs, but uh, this week I'm sure things will be a lot better, and we'll uh, talk about uh, those a little bit later on. But back to you, Colin Young, at the moment here at Scremerston, in uh, home of uh, Berwick Rugby Club, and a little bit of the history first of all for those who sort of aren't too familiar with what's happened. I mean, you've you've had some uh, pretty good internationals here, Gavin Kerr, uh, Craig Smith, as well, and uh, lots of other people who have actually gone on to big things at other clubs yeah um, obviously with Gavin and Craig both full cap internationals uh, we had Andrew Skeen and Mark Lee who was obviously sevens internationals whilst being at the club um, and then we've had a, an array of um, players represent um, Scotland at uh, age group level as well um, like Callum Maguire um, was just speaking about him there uh, earlier on who uh, played Scotland under 20s uh, Aaron Hall played England under 19s Max Lehmann like Dale said earlier on was another and how difficult is it to get that balance right, isn't it? Because you're, you're here to provide players with opportunities and it's fantastic for the club when you can see them go on to big things like that. The flip side of that is you also want to be moving up the national leagues from Division 3 into Division 2 and hopefully further uh, as well. Um, where is the balance there? How, how do you actually come to terms with that? I think what we've always said here at Berwick, if, if players are going away um, for the right reasons uh, to better themselves, we'll always probably shake their hand and say good luck, um, enjoy Prem 1, National 1, whatever that may be. Uh, if players are just leaving just because their friends has left or, or, or something like that, it's always a little bit more bitter to, to, to taste that because um, they're leaving for, for the wrong reasons. Um, but we, we, we've lost players, we've lost good players throughout the, the time, yeah, um, but if they, we always say the club's house so, uh, doors always open, if they want to come back, uh, like I said at the moment we've got Seb Trotter back at the club who, who left here as a, probably about a 21 year old lad to go and play three years or so at Jed Forest and then went up to Stu Mel and he's putting something back into the club uh, and, and for hand Hats off to Andrew Skeen as well, who'd done the exact same, you know, one last season. He promised the club he'd always finish his career here, and he was true to his word. So, yeah, we're, we're, always, we're always here for, for players to come back to, um, as long as they've went away and bettered themselves and, and gave it 110%. Did you try and get Andrew back for another season? We did, but uh, <laughs> he, he started playing football for a... Football? For, he did. He strikes me as just one of those guys that can play anything. He is. is he he is. is. Uh, uh, absolutely. Any sport. <laughs> so that's uh, that's Andrew Skeen, of course, and, and many others. And I think also you were saying about people wanting to stay at the club and give back. And after the Shield win... Oh, we've mentioned the Shield win. That was, what, 20 minutes into the programme. I knew we'd get to it somehow. But after the Shield win, uh, so many of the boys wanted... Uh, to, to stay on at the club because of the unfinished business because you were so close last time yeah we, well we in the end we lost one player Rory Hindoff who's went up to Musselburgh um, but he's obviously at the top level of Scottish rugby at the moment so hats off to him for doing that um, but we've, we've kept everybody else together we've not had the start that we probably wanted in the league campaign but it's still well within our grasp and if we perform and turn up on a Saturday um it, it could be anybody's and hopefully it's ours at the end of the season but like I say we've still got a long way to go um, and plenty of time to, to regroup and, and go again Well Paul turning back to you again uh, one name which keeps coming up time and time again even after the, the four matches is a guy called Aidan Rosie <laughs> He's scored a couple of tries, I think, isn't he, for, for you as well. And um, I saw him in training early on. This is before the season started. And uh, he was a guy that I was kind of making a note of and saying, you know, his attitude is, is terrific. He's, he's really getting involved in training. And uh, obviously, you know, having success on the park as well. Yeah, I think you're spot on the money there, Stuart. Um, he's a good eye mouth lad. Um, obviously crosses the border here at training, but um, he turns up every week. He puts in 100% of training. On the pitch, his, his attitude is fantastic. You know, quite often you can see guys who there's a lot of the verbals, but not, not a lot to back it up. Aiden's probably the polar opposite for me. You know, he, he says very little, but does loads, um, and he lets his actions do the talking. And I think he's now he's now actually getting the confidence in his own ability. He he can beat a man easily, it, and it's very rare he gets tackled by the first man. And I think as that confidence grows, I think you'll see him, you know, score more tries as the season goes on. 
um, and be a really important player for us. So, yeah, he's a really good lad. And who else has impressed you as forwards coach at the moment? Uh, I say it's very early days, but you know there are kind of chinks of light there, which is which is nice to see. Yeah, we, in some ways it'd be unfair to kind of single any of them out because they're a really good bunch and uh, they're quite tight knit. We've got some old heads in there, like you know we've got Kata Grower, who, who's fairly experienced, and then we've got um, Ali Grieve at eight. So obviously Ali's been up and down the leagues, um, but. Probably the the nucleus of those pack is you know are your Ryan Wilsons, your 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 Mason Emery's and your you know Ewan Thompsons. These guys who all came up through the juniors together. They're kind of really close friends, and I, I think for me these guys are growing every week. Um, Mason captains our lineouts. He's he's you know he's finding that voice, um, and we, we're now just starting to bring some of the younger lads in as well. So they're getting bloodied in the leagues for me. So Georgie Burnett and. We've got Stuart Farnaby, and it's just great that we're kind of getting that that mix. Um, so yeah, the, the, the pack is for me is pretty strong, and we've got a lot of competition there. Um, and guys are fighting for their jerseys, and that makes you know that makes it all the better for us, and a bit harder on a Tuesday night when we have to go into selection. What about the development system here then? Because it's always been good to see a lot of youngsters coming through uh, the, the whole system. You know, Berwick boys who then go on to play for the club. What sort of quantities are we looking at? I think if you're asking me the, the kind of the promising things you see around the club, so I know that the Colts and that under 18 level are struggling probably across Scotland at the moment because of the, the break. But you go down to the, you know, I, I regularly here on the minis on a Sunday, I have two girls who both play rugby, they're 15 and 10. And I think that you now have 40 odd girls training um, on a Tuesday night, which, you know, is, is fantastic to see. Um, Obviously, you don't expect that you're going to get that exposure to the kids' rugby when you have two girls, but the minds have embraced it. And I think the, the attitude of the likes of Dougie Hall and, you know, Paul Hasty here who encourage it, I think is fantastic. And it's just brilliant to see. I think it was about six girls when we first came about a year and a half ago. And now, as I say, there's over 40. So um, that to me is very promising. And I think that's the, the future of rugby because it needs to be exposed to you know, to everyone, to be honest. Very, very impressive, that total. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it, and they're great standard. And they're get, I think the great thing about girls rugby, and it, it's probably a, they're probably a little bit spoiled in some ways because they get exposure to play in places like the Orium and things like that quite regularly, um, where, where the facilities are fantastic. So um, the, the sessions they tend to get on Sunday, and, and it's a bit different from the boys. I mean, they don't, we don't have full squads and full teams. So what happens is you tend to go to places like Meadow Mill and things like that, and... There's really good SRU coaches there, and what they do is they mix and match. So you just throw in. We make sure we get teams. You play mixed games and things like that. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's the right approach for it because it's exposure to games, which is what brings it on quicker. And and the girls, like anybody, want to see you know the fruition of their work during the week. So um, no, it's something I'm involved in, and I, I'm always quite keen to see it grow. So it's a uh, it's a really positive, and I th- it's brilliant that Berwick are embracing it and. The likes of, we've got the likes of Dougie Hall that are driving it forward. And, I mean, 10 years ago, we wouldn't be having this conversation. I mean, <laughs> women's rugby has really grown. And, I mean, as a father yourself with, I say, two, two girls who are playing rugby, did you ever think that's going to happen? <laughs> Definitely not. I mean, <laughs> one went to the, my youngest one went to the dark side. So she, she was playing football originally. And oh, the, gosh. the older one was doing Highland dancing. So if you'd asked me, <laughs> I was expecting two years ago to, to be involved in, you know, in girls' rugby. I, I certainly wouldn't have seen it. But they, they both... They both come every Tuesday night. They're there every Sunday when they can. Um, and they, they love it. And when the choice comes for the youngest one, she, she picks rugby every Sunday when it's on a po- over the football, which is great. Fantastic. So job done. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> well done, Paul, there. Now, turning to something a bit more serious, and it's been a talking point that's been bubbling around the scene, Dale, for the last uh, few weeks now. And that is about whether we should be actually having relegation and promotion um, at this time uh, with all the COVID, with all the, the front row issues, etc. What's your own kind of take on that? Because you've obviously seen the arguments for and against. Um, I think that if we've went with the season and just the way that it's going just now, I know there's no cup competition and I think we have, we have to go with it. I think you have to go with promotion and relegation. I don't see why not. A lot of clubs have waited a long, long time to play rugby. I don't really see any clubs at the moment not giving their all. I've not really heard any clubs saying, oh, we're not trying hard this year or we're, we're, we're resting players for this game. Everybody's pretty much going full bore, which for me means that it's a competitive league and they're, they're going for it. So it, it's a difficult thing. I, I think the interesting thing will come at the culmination of the Super Six. I, I hope 
that the players who are left loose don't come back into the the amateur game at any of the clubs because it will really dilute it and I think that's a different argument Um, but overall I think that promotion relegation should still stay I think if you look at it at the moment in like bigger are a team who are progressing quite well Dalkeith are a team that are progressing quite well and Berwick are a team who have been competitive two losses away from home and just speaking about it we can put that down to inexperience of the guys and they'll learn as as it goes on so really it's the same as we were pre-Covid the teams who are strong are still going to be strong. They, we can't. I don't think we can shield clubs in this time that are maybe not going to be sustainable. I think this needs to be a little bit more. You know, there needs to be support, and we need to make sure that as many clubs as possible are, are, are surviving. But we need to try and get a more realistic landscape of club rugby so that we can push it forward instead of trying to, you know, be a bit too nurturing for the ones that might drag it down a little bit. Colin, I guess uh, you feel exactly uh, the same way there. Absolutely. I think, um, yeah, you have to have a league season uh, with promotion or relegation. It has to be meaningful. Uh, If you're just going out on a Saturday with nothing really to play for, as in promotion or relegation, it's just meaningless, in my opinion. Um, And boys might just taper away from the game because there's no meaningful fixture. Well, there are not many good things uh, to come from COVID, but there is one thing that we can point to, and it's sitting behind you at the moment. It means you've got the shield for a little bit longer. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's still in pride and place in the, in the cabinet there. It means a lot, doesn't it? Yes. And we haven't really kind of talked about it yet, but we, we can't have you both here without sort of <laughs> mentioning, particularly as you teased yourself the other, the other week when you were actually in the shadows of the stadium playing Murrayfield Wanderers, and uh, you were probably just chomping at the bit ready to go in the big <laughs> doors, weren't you? Ah, it was a special day, Stuart. Uh, <laughs> it will definitely be one that lives in the memory for a long time. If you took one moment out of that day, what would it be? One moment. Yeah, there were so many. <laughs> um, I've said to you before, I'd I done a kind of Pat Cash moment <laughs> when, I, when I went and found uh, uh, Kevin Armstrong in the, in the crowd because uh, Kevin was a, a, a great friend and a coach of mine. Uh, I invited him in to, to present the jerseys that day uh, and, and, and finding, finding him in the crowd was, was quite pleased and I can always remember my words was uh, along the lines of I think we've done it and it was a little bit more special than how we won it Kev and he says I, uh, you're right there and it, I'm going to say a close second uh, and it's uh, about Paul um, <laughs> was, was, um, I selected Paul on the Tuesday night um, and I said, you want to go? And he's like, aye, aye. And obviously he was, he was like a, a, a schoolboy, just <laughs> like first day of school in the uniform. He was like raring to go. And I got slated off of Kevin uh, for picking him, saying, why you went with him for a young boy? And then afterwards, Kevin said, actually, when you brought Paul on, he made a difference. So he says, aye, you do know what you're talking about. <laughs> So, Paul, there we are. Kevin didn't want you on the pitch. <laughs> I, I can't see why. I'd been retired eight years. I hadn't trained. <laughs> and I was just turning 40 year old, so I, I definitely can understand. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'll always appreciate the fact that Colin gave me that chance to, to play at Murrayfield, which I, I hadn't ever managed in my senior career. So, um, to get that opportunity on that day, and for the day to turn out the way it did, um, yeah, it was fantastic. And I, I don't think I could ever retire for the fifth time again uh, a better note than that no of course I'll always remember that Ali Grieve kick ahead why you well, never passed I why? know <laughs> he could have done he should have done maybe but the ball bounced just over your head and into his arms I mean that could have been you scoring at Murrayfield story of my life Stuart just <laughs> six inches too short <laughs> <laughs> he's always been overlooked <laughs> yeah. but what, what, what a moment as well just to be next to, to Ali Grieve when he scored that and you, you were there first to congratulate him and that, that was really the one that, that sealed it wasn't it yeah and to be honest it's, it's great to take the pitch with the boys as well because you, you can coach guys and you don't you don't always get to appreciate what they do um I mean, obviously not Ali's kicking ability apart from that one. Um, so yeah, it was it was tough going, but to get on the pitch and just to be enjoy that with the guys was was fantastic. And the the night wasn't too shabby either. To be honest, <laughs> it was, how, how long did that last? <laughs> well, well, what we can remember probably. <laughs> <laughs> now, Dale, you'll remember obviously uh, that particular match. I mean, it was an extraordinary match. Wasn't it thirty five eleven down, and uh, they come back to win. You know, not just inching it, but fifty seven. 
points to 35 in the end. I mean, I mean, one of the most extraordinary matches I've ever seen. Yeah, it was it was great to watch, and I think as a neutral, um, you know, as, as having no affiliation to to Berwick or um, Greenock, wasn't it? Greenock Wanderers. Greenock Wanderers yeah, yes, because Graham yes. Hogg was playing for Graham them. Graham Hogg yeah. gave that pass that was intercepted, of course. All uh, right, shall we show it? <laughs> yeah, I think we should. <laughs> the, um, yeah, I, I think just just watching it and watching a game of rugby being so open, like you know, being so open, so competitive. Um, and so exciting as well. I think that was it was just one of those things that you know you couldn't have got a better setting at Murrayfield. You could see, and I think it's always good. Like I, I remember, Peebles got to the Shield final against Glasgow Hawks, and I was injured, um, and I never ever felt bad or felt like down or anything because it was such a great opportunity to see the just be involved in the, the team, and, and and you got that feel from from Berwick. You could see the the pride when they're walking out. You can see how close knit and joyous they were when they won. It's just it's just such a, a great day. It's a shame now I feel that it's it's not as as well supported as it used to be years and years ago, but that's just modern rugby, isn't it? That's just the way we are with professionalism. But it doesn't take away from the celebrations and, you know, feeling feeling like it's it, you're properly in the spotlight for, you know, the day. That's your day at Murrayfield. So yeah, it was great to watch. Well, it's time to have a look at uh, what's happening this weekend. And our commentary match this weekend is down here at Scremerston. It's uh, Berwick against Howe of Fife, who are just uh, just above you in the table, uh, Paul. And um, certainly you'll be giving them a special Scremerston welcome, no doubt. Uh, but Howe of Fife, again, a great great name, great team from the past as well. They're another club who want to get you know back up into you know Division Two and, and beyond as well. And uh, you know they'll 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 give you a good match. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you never quite know what the teams are going to turn up now after the break, but certainly last time we played them away, they were a, a very strong outfit. They were strong in the pack. Um, to be honest, I thought that was one of our best performances of the season when we were up there. Um, and I'd like to think that this Saturday is going to be the same kind of springboard for us. So, yeah, it'll be a tough game. I, I think we'll, we're getting really good support down here at the moment. It'll be cold because it's Scremerston, so it always is. Well, do you know, I, I've seen the seen the app. It says 16 degrees. That's not too bad for Berwick. <laughs> I'll never believe that. The wind chill will be minus 10. Oh, so. right. Okay. Right. No, but we, we, we're certainly looking forward to just putting that right and getting a W on the board on Saturday. Colin, of course, how of Fife. Um, what was your own memories of how of Fife? Um, we've, we've had always pretty much a close competitive run against them um, to the point that uh, I can remember going up there about ten year ago, uh, and um, we were we were winning with uh, another game where we were winning with virtually the last play of the game, and and we didn't seal it out, and they had been unbeaten at home for for many and many a year, uh, and we we run them that close, uh, and they they went on to to win the league that year, um, so now we we we've given them a good game at, at every time we've played them, what I can remember. They're one of those, I think in recent years, they've been a, a little bit of an institution of rugby with the, the players that they've had through the horns. You know, George and Pete Horn, Steve Wilson went to play for Burham Year. Uh, Chris Mason was the back row captain for them. And Chris Fasaro as well. They were all Howie Fife guys. They were part of that team who, you know, dominated Scottish school rugby for, for years. And it, it seems like they've got a real good network. They're always very, very competitive, but it'll be a difficult game, but I, I, I would fancy Berwick for it. Well, we're certainly looking forward to uh, being here for that one. Stuart McFarlane will uh, be commentator for that game in National League 3. Let's look at the other games now. Of course, tomorrow night, Southern Knights against Stirling County. A bit of a dead rubber because we know Stirling Knight, uh, Stirling Knights? Uh, <laughs> Southern Knights have actually uh, gone through uh, to the final to meet Air, which will be happening at the uh, Dam Health Stadium in Murrayfield in a couple of weeks' time. What do you think... Rob Christie is going to do as far as the team's concerned. Is he going to wrap his best players, his star players, in cotton wool for the final? I think the best person to answer would be would be Colin. But you know, it's it's the coach's choice. I think that's a difficult position that you're in. Do you do you rest your players and then they're fresh for the next week and you win and everybody puts it down to the fact they got a rest, or do you rest your players and then you lose and everybody puts it down to the fact they're rusty? So, you know, it's a difficult choice and how do you balance that squad? Some players, well, all players are different. Some players might need game time. They might work better on game time. Some players might need to be rested. Some of the older heads might need a week off. So it's it, Sterling looked good as well. Uh, their win against Terriot, so it's going to be a difficult game for them. Um, so I don't think they'll take it lightly. They certainly won't want to go into the final on the back of a loss. And they can still, you know, they can still finish the campaign top um, for some mind games as well, going into the final against Ayrshire, Ayrshire Bulls. But, you know, Rob Christie, that's what he's got to do his job. You know, he's got to, he's got to make the decision. 
Well, I hear what you're saying. Let's go to Colin immediately. Colin, what would you do? I would go full strength. Um, uh, and like Dale said, it's because winning, winning becomes a habit um, and you want to win your last game because um, you're only as good as your last game and going into a, a major final with a defeat as your last game it puts the jitters up a little bit so I would go full strength uh, get the bodies on the line uh, and, and try and finish the season as strongly as possible OK, well it'll be very interesting to see what he does indeed do Let's have a look at the Premiership now then because uh, Hoyk looking for their first away win long trip to Rubislaw, Aberdeen Grammar but surely they're going to uh, get the points for this one yeah, you, you would think so. I think they're definitely going to that game favourites. Aberdeen being pretty poor, I think. Um, they, they looked pretty good on Saturday. I think they, they played some good rugby. Matty Douglas spoke beforehand about moving Kirk Ford to 10. I think he brought a little bit more control. Um, he brought his runners into the game a little bit more. Unfortunate to lose um, Logan gordon Willie as well to head injury. So it'll be interesting to see if he makes it through this week. But, you know, they've got some good players. I think Ronan McKean maybe didn't get involved in the game enough. I think he could have made a lot of damage, but they've got, you know, they've got a good balance, good back row, a good front row as well now. So um, I think Hoy could go up there, uh, heavy favourites. And I, I think they should be targeting five points up there. Jed Forrest against Musselburgh, and again, Lewis Young was saying that you know he'll be very disappointed if they don't get five points against Musselburgh. Having said that, Musselburgh have started pretty well, apart from the the match against Glasgow Hawks where they were thirty one nil down by the break. But that really was a very different performance to how we've seen them play uh, in the other matches. Yeah, I think that's um, you know the, we always talk about the season kind of plateauing and trying to figure out who's going to be in what position. Um, it's I think it's starting to get to that point now. Maybe a couple of more games and we'll a true reflection on the league but um, you know Jed certainly that's going to be a difficult game must have travelled quite well as well you know they're not a, they're not a bad side um, obviously border connections with Graham Patterson as well coaching so you know they've got they've got good players a good club they've been quite steady over the last few years as well so you know they know how to win games and I don't think they'll be intimidated going down to Riverside Park but Jed will be really buoyant off of the back of their, their performance against Mar. I think that took me by surprise how close it was because I know how formidable Mark can be um, so I think you know Jed, Jed will be they'll be going into that maybe slight favourites but they need to back up and make sure they pick up the win four points first and then worry about the five points after The other match of course is Selkirk against Mar and uh, Selkirk um, when everyone writes Selkirk off they always seem to click into place and of course the last time Mar went to Philip Hoch, um it was a Selkirk win I don't think Mar particularly liked the borders too much um, you know, I remember when they were flying high and what would have been, I think, maybe it was National 2 at the time. And, um, you know, they came down and got beat by Peebles, um, which was a big surprise at the time. Um, so I don't think they particularly like the brand of, of rugby that Borders teams play. I think it's it, it does move, the, they've got a big pack. Um, Sturgeon, when he's playing at 10, I don't think he was playing 10 at the weekend, but, you know, he's a good control in 10. Bickerstaffs, when they're on form as well, are, are brilliant players. Um, so... It, I think when the Borders teams like to play that expansive rugby and I don't think really there's a better team at the moment than Selkirk for playing a wide brand of rugby you know they get that big pack moved about tires them a bit and keeps the games a little bit tighter so they'll be hoping to do that against Mar but a, a very difficult game especially on the back of a defeat they'll be they'll be wanting to try and put in a performance first and foremost and you know, if Mar don't like coming to the borders, then I'm sure Selkirk will try and make it as uncomfortable as possible for them. They'll certainly do that, that's for sure. National one then, the big game that really screams out at me is uh, Kelso against Bigger. Yeah, I think this is a, a, a huge game for Kelso. I think it's a, a bigger game for them than it is for Bigger. Um, because Kelso are in a position now, I feel that they could really, they can really drag Bigger back down into a, a promotion fight and a, a title fight. If they lose this game, they've, they've, they've got a big, big gap to try and make up in that league. But if they win, it, it makes it really, really interesting, not just for them, but for Gala, for Ayr, for Melrose, for Bigger, Kelso. They seem to be the teams at the moment that are cutting each other's throats. So it's a huge game, huge game for Kelso. Dundee against Gala. Dundee very good at home normally. And Gala, uh, on their last travel, of course, to Ayr, uh, didn't get the result they were looking for. So um, they've got a point to prove as well. Yeah, um, D Dundee is a very difficult place to go. Um, I had a few hidings there for people's. Um, so it is, it is difficult. T uh, Tim McCavener, who plays for Gala now, ex-Dundee player. Um, so a little bit of interest in that battle as well. But Gala, one of their players who, who mentioned a, a couple of weeks ago that you know this is a game that they, they've certainly targeted. They know they can win it quite comfortably. This falls into their little batch of games that they feel that they can pick up quite a lot of points and stamp a lot of authority on. So off the back of a good win against Muir, 
back up on the road and get a good one against Dundee. Conference goes high, and I think it's Heriot's after that. So they've they've certainly got a, a nice run of of fixtures against you know teams who aren't in the borders that don't want to cut their throats. Now, are we going to get a backlash? Melrose versus Cartha Queens Park. I think we ha- you have to. I think it, there'll be a, there'll be a little eye, although. Melrose are quite a focused club so I don't think they'll pay too much attention but there will be a little bit of a gaze over at what's happening at Pointer Park because the Kelso bigger game is going to be huge and probably the first time in the first time ever I think Melrose will be wanting Kelso to win so it's going to be a it's going to be an interesting weekend actually I think this is when we talk about the league settling out this is going to be a big weekend for the, the league settling out bigger will be wanting to put down a marker against Kelso Kelso will be wanting to beat um Bigger and Melrose will be wanting to stamp authority as well and, and bounce back and try and get themselves back in the, you know, the promotion chase. National two, Peebles, your old team, of course, and for the third week running, they're against undefeated uh, opposition, and that's Dumfries Saints who are going great guns, five out of five. Yeah, well, I can confirm that I'm out for this weekend. I'm not <laughs> going to be playing. They, yeah, I, th- I think Peebles, uh, they, they might be a little bit deflated by the defeat against GHK, but I, I think on the balance of of the way the game went. You know, I think they can they can come to terms with why they got beat. But again, it's it's at home, and people have always played really really well at home in these competitive leagues. You know, they've they've obviously it's not a fortress by any means, but you know, in these tight games when league leaders and you know they're in a promotion battle, they very rarely lose at home. Um, so, but it's a big game. You've got to do your talking in the park, and people's have certainly got to do that again I've, I've said it a few weeks they've got good players in there they've got really good players um, you know led well Neil Hogarth the captain they've got experience from Willie Aitken in the front row um, halfbacks David Collins is playing some of the best rugby that I've I ever thought I would see him play he's, he's really really impressed me and then got a good 10 in Greg Rayburn as well so you know Lewis McLennan playing 13 they've got a lot of good balance in that squad but you know so have done freeze. so they need to put in a performance keep the discipline um, and they need to win this game to, to have any aspirations of going up Duns have had not a good season not the start they wanted they've had a lot of injuries as well and uh, it doesn't get any easier for them they're at home but they're against the uh, the table topper so it's bottom against top there in Ross High yeah that's it it's always a difficult game mentally to try and you know rev yourself up for when you're when you're bottom of a table and you're cranking your neck all the way to look at the top and see who you're going to be playing and you know it's it's going to be hard for them and we we, we spoke about when you win it builds confidence when you, when you lose consistently it becomes a habit as well and, and, and Duns will be hoping to try and put in a performance they'll know they start underdogs they don't need to listen to this and, and fight, <laughs> go into that and go oh right we're underdogs for this but you know they'll want to put in a performance and you know, put a bit of pride back in the jersey and hopefully build on it from there because at some point the, the ship will steady uh, but they need to be, you know, putting in the performances and playing these big teams, that's what a league campaign's about. East League 2, they do get to play this week, which is good news. Hoyt Lindeen, who have had a couple of defeats but they're at home to Livingston who haven't won yet so a great opportunity at Volunteer Park for them to, to get some points on the board. Yeah, I think the big bonus is that you're not going through to Livingston. So, um, <laughs> But yeah, it's a good opportunity for them, especially after a week off to, to try and, you know, get... Get a, a, a little bit more of a, a more consistent performance back in their league campaign. Again, at Livingston, notoriously when you know I think when I first started following rugby, senior rugby when I was out of school, and Livingston were quite a big team at the time. You know, always a big pack, a big difficult pack to play. Um, so that it will be a hard afternoon for them. But Hoik's the one of the, the heartlands of, of rugby in Scotland, so I'm sure they've got the talent that they'll be able to kind of put them at the sword. Langham also at home this week, and they take on North Berwick, who only got defeated for the very first time uh, against Pennycook, and Pennycook, of course, are the, the team that uh, drew with Langham. So on paper there, Langham should sneak it, but it's going to be close. Yeah, I think it will. North Berwick are another place which is, you know, they've got a lot of good, they've got a lot of good talent that came through there in the last few years. I remember a, a player, Callum Mark, who ended up playing for Heriots. He was a Scotland age grade centre, short guy, really, really good player, and he loved North Berwick. They had a really good, they've got a good school system. So notoriously, they're a, they're a difficult team to play. But Langham, you know, if you're looking at results on paper, they'll take a bit of confidence from what they've done with with Penny Cook and and going to that, hoping for a, a win. East League's going to be very intriguing in Division 3 because Earlston and Galloway M both had uncomfortable uh, weeks in the last couple of weeks. But Earlston are home to Liberton, who haven't won yet, and Galloway M are, are going to Edinburgh Northern. But Earlston won at Edinburgh Northern, even though Edinburgh Northern were undefeated at the time. So uh, two intriguing games there. 
Yeah, I think uh, Erston will, again will be wanting to, especially a team that's not won yet this season in Liberton, they'll be wanting to, to compound miser- their misery and, and get a win. And there's nothing better at home than doing it, especially, you know, in, in the social levels that you get a good win, the atmosphere's there, you get in the club rooms and you ha- you kind of have a laugh with your teammates. So hopefully they can put in a good performance, enjoy their Saturday, get a win and, uh, you know, it'll make their stats look a lot better in that league. And But the Galloway M side of things, it's going to be, it's difficult to, to gauge what the, the impact of all the injuries that they're they're suffering at the moment. I know they've got a, an abundance of players and talent of players uh, that they can pick from, but you know they'll, again they're going to have to try and reshuffle their team and and, and try and get a, a strong fifteen out at the weekend to, to beat Edinburgh Northern. So it's going to be difficult for them. But again, at that level, there's there's always chops and changes and surprise results. So they'll just be hoping the border teams can pull through. Now the other games from the Reserve Leagues Division 1 and 2 and the semi-juniors are on the screen at the moment and of course uh, Kelso ladies who are down to play Howard Fife funnily enough uh, they're going uh, to take a trip down there uh, on Sunday all being well they've had uh, again a few uh, postponements and, and cancellations this season so hopefully they'll get a game this week but next week we're going to do something a wee bit different it's a referee special Stephen Turnbull will be uh, joining us and uh, one of his colleagues and uh, everyone likes to talk about referees so if you've got a question that you'd like to put to one of the borders rugby referee society about anything at all i'm sure they'll be delighted to answer your calls and our uh, email address is on the screen now but for now uh, from scremerson and our host berwick rugby club paul pringle the forwards coach and colin young obviously the head coach and of course from dale and i as well thanks much indeed for the pleasure of your company as i say we'll be back in seven days time bye for now (laughs) 